Thank you, Betsy. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you guys are having a great future stack. Are you? Everyone? Yes? yes. Nice. Is everyone awake after lunch, or are we? Yes. Oh, well. All right. Uh, if you're awake, you might be asleep at the end of the session, so I, I apologize <laughs> up front if this is uh, not interesting enough. I try to make this as interesting as possible, so let's, let's start. Before we start Safe Harbor, we are going to make a few forward, uh, I'm going to make a few forward-looking statements in this presentation, so if, uh, so this sort of just covers it, legal requires us to have it. Uh, and there's another warning or safe harbor for me. Any Game of Thrones fans here? Woo! Are you guys all up to date? Yeah. Yes. Are you guys going to kill me if I give away any spoilers? No. no. Thank God. Because I have tons. <laughs> I have tons planned for this. Anyways, uh, my name is Neha. I am the product manager here at New Relic. Uh, I'm primarily responsible for APM, APM agents specifically. So I'm here to talk to you about how we enable agile teams in a polyglot world. A lot of awesome, uh, very trendy words in that title. I thought that would attract a lot more people to come attend my session. So I hope it didn't work as well, but well, worth a try. So agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 20, 25 minutes along with Dale to talk to you about what we've been doing across APM and why we've been doing it. And my second and actually the most uh, important agenda item is to convince you that APM is exactly like Game of Thrones. No difference. Absolutely no difference. So with that being said, let's get started. So at FutureStack, you've been hearing about these trends. Like everyone's talking about it. Everyone's talking about breaking the monolith, taming the monolith, moving to the cloud. The fundamentals of how we test, develop software has changed. It has changed dramatically. Everyone, I'm sure a lot of you are already in the process of breaking down your monoliths or are considering or somewhere in the process of you know, breaking down those monoliths. And there are, there are plenty of advantages of breaking down your monoliths. Your microservices are smaller, easier to deal with. You can deploy code changes faster. It enables teams to move faster, deploy stuff faster, innovate faster, right? And what come the challenge or Oh, another advantage of breaking down your monolith is that your programmers or developers have the ability or have the option of choosing any programming language that they're comfortable in to develop uh, all of these services. And it's, it's a trend that's pretty relevant, catching on, loose speaking about it, like everyone's talking about it. Here at FutureStack, I'm sure there were multiple talks that you heard that spoke about breaking down the monolith and moving to the cloud, moving to the cloud, similar thing. Like, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Everyone is either in the process of moving to the cloud or considering moving to the cloud. And again, just like the monolith, it helps teams develop and deploy software faster. What did I do? Clearly. Not very good with technology. Uh, so uh, yeah, move to the cloud. So infrastructure as a service has been around a, uh, for a while, and it just helps teams to you know deploy applications faster. You're doing away with. Uh, the effort of like maintaining data centers, it's helping bringing down costs, but it's also helping you build reliable, scalable applications that will work at scale. This is pretty awesome. But as I said, programmers or developers now have the independence of choosing any programming language of their <coughs> choice. Game of Thrones analogy number one. This is exactly like Westeros. You have like seven or eight major languages, and you have so many other small language e ecosystems. So I like to call this space, or the language, APM language space right now, Softwareos. It's exactly like that. We have seven or eight different languages that you know, are pretty prevalent in the, in the enterprise space for de uh, developing applications. And then there are small app, other languages, uh, language ecosystems like, let's say, Perl, Phoenix, Elixir, that people are increasingly using to build applications. So don't, some similarity there, right? Softwareos, Westeros. Languages, houses, makes sense. <laughs> Peace so far to me. Uh, yeah, so what's happening is with all of these uh, different programming languages or technologies that are being used to build these applications, our world has become super complicated. It's not only changed the way where we deploy, deploy code, the way we build code, 
everything's changed. So it's become a really, really fragmented Wester software rows, basically. So you see these small factions have these own set, their own set of behaviors and patterns and people who use uh, Java uh, are even now building Java microservices. People have Ruby applications, but there are newer technologies like people are deploying Node applications. So it's, uh, it's become super complicated now. And this is pretty awesome in terms of helping teams develop and move faster, deploy code faster to the, uh, you know, into production and troubleshoot issues faster and everything is fine. But uh, how many of you guys have heard uh, with monoliths like finding a problem is like finding a needle in the haystack. It's a pretty cliched uh, analogy that's thrown around. But with these newer fragmented ecosystems, the problem is multifold now. Now you're trying to find a needle in a haystack that you don't even know that fucking exists. And if it does, you don't know where it is. So it, the problem is much more complicated than it was before. Like finding problems is becoming really, really hard. And without having visibility into what's actually happening within each of these different language ecosystems or applications in your stack, it's impossible to know what's really happening. And I think Luz iterated this multiple times too in his keynote yesterday. You need to instrument everything because you need visibility into what's happening with these, within these individual services. And here at New Relic, that's what we are here to do. So, no matter what language ecosystem you choose, what language you develop your uh, applications on, where you deploy your applications, we are here to support you. We are here to provide you that visibility. At New Relic, we are here to make the complex stuff more understandable so that you can make more data-driven decisions. <laughs> and, and so no matter what you do, where you deploy your back, uh, where you de oh, I just gave it away. Wherever I spoiled it completely. Wherever you deploy your apps, we have your back. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, anyways, moving on. So we have a customer here, Dale. He, uh, he works at Expedia, and he's also one of the customers going through the journey of breaking down their monoliths into microservices, and he's here to share his story. So welcome, Dale. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm gonna read off this little tablet. I hope you guys don't mind. So I'll just read very monotone. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So I'm Dale Lovelace. I'm the technical operations manager with the Expedia Affiliate Network, but just for today, you can all call me Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> so I head up a fantastic team of guys spread out around six locations worldwide. We, uh, we take care of all the infrastructure for the Expedia Affiliate Network, maintaining, building, monitoring, everything there is to do with the infrastructure. Um, e Expedia Affiliate Network, which is Ian for short, we are the B2B division of Expedia. Our main product is a back-end hotel API. So if you want to sell hotels and you don't want to go through all the trouble of, you know, building hotels, hiring night clerks, all that sort of thing, we've got you covered. You can just come to us, get all your hotel inventory. We provide some of the major brands like, like a Despagar, Euro Bookings, and Ryanair. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about our journey, which uh, may be a lot like yours. Um, I've been with Expedia now for 15 years. That's uh, pretty amazing in the tech world, I know. Uh, I've been with Ian for six. Um, when I started with Ian six years ago, we had one great, big, massive monolithic API. Um, every call you can make, list, search, book, anything you wanted to do, it was this one big, huge monolithic API. As a matter of fact, in the very beginning, it actually, even in this API, hosted an HTML-based website in the exact same code base as the API. It, it, was, it was a beast. But, but it was OK. There were only a few dev teams. We were pretty small. Ops was small. Dev was small. Everybody was getting along. It was like the children of the forest. We were all happy, <laughs> running around, playing. We had our API, and it worked. It was good. But uh, eventually, more dev teams started coming on board, more things started happening. There was a lot of contention fighting over when you could release for the API. And unfortunately, my team was the gatekeeper for this big monolithic API. So we had to decide when you could release, who could release. It was, it was just a complete mess. So we decided we had to do something about it. So Op stepped in, saved the day, we're the heroes. We actually took the monolith and split it into multiple pieces. 
we took all similar calls in the API and we routed those guys into to different pieces. The four sections were actually the exact same code base in the beginning. We deployed the same thing, but just routed the calls. And then we said, OK, developers, now all your calls go to different places. Start working on weeding out. So they started pulling out the code they didn't need, making them actually into distinct code bases. They were reaping. They were showing, except for the Greyjoys, of course. They got, they got the code bases nice. <laughs> I'm just coming up with this. Um, they got the code bases split out, and the four services worked very well. Now uh, the booking service could release when they wanted to. The avail service could release when they wanted to. Things got a lot better. Um, we, were, we were doing pretty good. But as it goes, we kept growing. We kept growing. More dev teams. More dev teams. So finally, our seven kingdoms had turned into 20 kingdoms. And the, the, big, the big four macro services just weren't working out. So... Earlier, late last year, early this year, we started building a brand new world-class API. Uh, we started right from the very beginning. We decided that we were going to use microservices, Docker, and it was all eventually going to be deployed in, in AWS. So this was a, a fundamental change in anything that we had ever done before. I mean, in just a few years, we'd gone from this great big massive thing to, I don't even know how many microservices, all in, in Docker containers, which we had never worked with before, all eventually going into AWS, which we'd never worked with before. And uh, traditionally, we had used just a hodgepodge of different monitoring systems, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And, and no matter what monitoring system it was we used, it required an advanced degree in operations wizardry to get anything out of these monitoring systems. So it quickly became apparent that we had to do something to make this thing easier, that we were going to need help from the developers to get to where we needed to go. We needed them doing their own monitoring. So we, we did tons of demos, trials, late nights, and so much whiskey to get to where we finally decided that, all right, Here's the way to go. We're going to add New Relic. We're going to put New Relic on all of our services. We're going to make this thing right. So first of all, we signed up for a New Relic trial. Uh, one of the very first things we did was install the AWS billing module. And magically, the accountants loved us. So with the accountants on our side, we then discreetly put New Relic on a few of our on-premise applications. Um, just a server here, a server there, started doing a little bit of monitoring, started posting some new Relic screenshots into Slack. The developers started seeing that and saying, hey, what's this thing you guys are doing? So we uh, sort of started spreading the rumors about new Relic, started spreading the word, that sort of thing. The developers became very, very interested in this. So we, we actually worked with new Relic to set up a training at each of our major locations, London, Seattle, and Springfield, Missouri. Yes, Springfield, Missouri is one of our major locations. <laughs> uh, New Relic was great. They, uh, they brought a professional trainer into each one of our locations. We did an eight-hour training, invited all the developers, made it very, very developer-focused. Um, by the time that eight-hour day was over, the developers all wanted New Relic. They, they were breaking down our door, basically. Um, as luck, our good planning, we'll call it, might have it, just a couple of weeks after our trainings in New Relics came, it was time to migrate our very first Java service into AWS. Um, during the migration, as I said, the developers had just been through the training. It was pretty fabulous. We set up a Slack channel for the migration. All the developers started posting their own little dashboards into, uh, into to Slack. It's like, hey, here's my dashboard. Oh, no, I've got a better dashboard. Oh, look at this Nurkle query. And by the time the day of our first uh, AWS migration was over, we probably had about 50 dashboards. And these were all set up by developers, not by operations. No one told them how or what to do. These guys were just coming up with stuff their own, which was another fundamental change because this has never happened before. Monitoring has always been something that operations had done after the fact. These Developers, they, they were having fun with it. It was great. They'd just been through training. It was easy to use. It didn't require an advanced degree in operations wizardry. They just started setting up their own dashboards, putting those guys in there. Um, here's one of the, da one of the uh, dashboards. This was actually set up by a dev manager, not even a developer, um, where they could compare the, the, the speed and the, the errors and the number of calls that were going into AWS versus going into on-prem. So this is one of the dashboards we happen to have kept around. And like I said, this was totally set up by, by a dev manager, not even a developer. 
So this was great and fun. Um, this was a Java, a Java service where we had the APM installed, we had the infrastructure installed, but our next major migration is going to be a completely serverless service. So like, how the hell do you monitor a, a service where you, you can't put an agent on, where you can't install anything? Um, this is our next boy, this is our content service. It's mostly composed of Lambdas, SNS, and Elasticsearch. So New Relic once again came in and saved the day. The, uh, the AWS service monitors in AWS allowed us to create dashboards everywhere and monitor all of our serverless services. Now this is not actually quite live yet, so ignore the, ignore the exceptions. They won't happen once we get this thing into prod. <laughs> but, uh, we can monitor all of the SNS, all of the Lambdas, every, all the Elasticsearch, all the stuff we're doing in the, uh, in the serverless services right here in New Relic. So that brings me to the end of my little talk. Just one more thing, that if you want to be the hero of SoftwareOS, all you need to do is get New Relic, give it to your developers, and sit on the throne of code. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. Thank you, Nia. You shouldn't call yourself Jon Snow. He knew <laughs> nothing. You know a lot. So I don't see uh, why you should call yourself Jon Snow. All right. That was pretty awesome, uh, learning about your journey and how New Relics helped you uh, along the process. So let me now go to the boring part of the presentation. I'm just kidding. This is more interesting than the first part. Uh, so when we talk about giving visibility to our customers or to you guys to see what's happening within your applications, this is we classify it in three broad categories. One is instrumentation, uh, tracing, and basically supporting cloud services. We'll go into each of these in detail. So Game of Thrones analogy number two. Danny is sailing to Westeros because she wants to be the, she's the rightful heir to the kingdom. I think so, right? Maybe not, but we'll see. Uh, no, I so, am. <laughs> <laughs> so when she is making that journey, and she knows uh, the different kingdoms in Westeros and how conflicted they are, and like uh, how many houses are there and what the current state of the houses are. But when she is going, sailing into Westeros, it's really important for Danny to know how many Dothrakis are on her side, how many, you know, Unsullied are on her side, how many dragons she has. Uh, she should know that, but just in case. Uh, what is the size of her fleet? Uh, so how many, basically, how many people are willing to fight for her? And once she makes that, once she reaches Westeros, lands in Dragonstone, she should know where her friends are and what they are capable of, you know? What kind of weapons, like, she didn't know when she was sailing to Westeros, but winter is coming, and winter is here, actually. So she needs to know exactly how many resources are available to her when she is making that journey to actually last the long night and fight, fight the Night King. Similar to that, exactly similar is what instrumentation is, because that's telling you where your resources are within your application, how these resources are doing, and it gives you complete visibility into what's happening within each of your uh, services. And that's what we call instrumentation, and instrument, if you instrument everything, you will have visibility into your entire application stack to see what's going on within your application. <coughs> and that's why we focus here at New Relic a lot in providing a lot of that instrumentation, that great experience out of the box, so you can deploy New Relic agents across your application stack and get instant visibility into what's happening within your applications. Now, with that being said, here are a few updates. I'm sure you've heard at least some of them over the course of the last two days while you've been here at FutureSAC. But the first big thing that we announced was support for uh, .NET Core 2.0. Lou spoke about it in his uh, keynote. The idea is that, hey, .NET, uh, uh, the community, when Microsoft acknowledges that people should be able to move to should be able to deploy their .NET applications, not only on a Windows Cloud server, but on Linux too. So we are getting ahead of that, and we, are, uh, we announced support for .NET Core 2.0 beta. Uh, it's an open beta, which is available for both Windows and Linux uh, servers. So if you're deployed uh, on 
that and uh, you're planning to use .NET Core 2.0, please reach out. We'd love to have you guys on the beta program. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening on the .NET uh, legacy uh, framework too. And we've been uh, busy churning out instrumentation for, let's say, Oven over here. Rest Sharp is coming soon. But we've worked, a, uh, we've worked a lot on improving the auto instrumentation and you know, upgrading our support for the old .NET framework. Now, moving on to my favorite house, House Stark, uh, or as I like to call it, the Java agent. Uh, so recently we announced support for Vertex. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with what Vertex is. It's basically a toolkit that's used to write uh, really highly reliable, uh, highly reactive microservices in Java uh, or JVM-based languages. It actually supports uh, writing these microservices in Kotlin or Groovy, Scala. It also supports JavaScript. So we announced support for this instrumentation support, and Vertex is a huge framework, but we've announced support for at least uh, three of the modules, so web, core, and HTTP client. And with that Java agent, you should be able to you know, view what's happening, its ability to create transactions, so you know exactly what request, uh, the code path your request follows through your application. Uh, it can handle async and uh, web calls, uh, it can track external calls to any databases or external services, and we have another incubator module called Coda Hill incubator module that can help you monitor your drop visit metrics that Vertex uses or exposes. With that, uh, we've also been busy doing other instrumentation support. You see starts from House Stark and then goes on to maybe House I don't know. I don't even know what Node.js would be. I was trying really hard to create an analogy for each of the houses, but after Stark and Lannisters, I stopped. Actually, I, that brings me to the point. I forgot to say. I thought I think .NET is like House Lannister. You can ask me why I think that later on. But so across the different language ecosystems, this is what's been going on. I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with Java 9 and what's happening there. Lots of interesting stuff it was thought of as an old legacy. Uh, ecosystem, but there's so much happening. Like Vertex was just one example of how J the Java community itself is embracing the need to write reactive, super async applications, and Java 9 is sort of just one step in that direction, supporting modularity and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. We're working on support for that. So if any of you are planning to switch to a Java 9 runtime anytime soon, please get in touch with us. We'd love to work with you. We have an early access agent that's already available for you guys to test out and see uh, how it works for your environment. Node uh, deserves another special mention too. We've been doing a lot of stuff around Node 8, uh, and especially around async await. So if you're using async stuff within the Node framework, it, we are working on support uh, for that too, and I believe there's a beta for that too. Uh, a lot of these slides were created like two weeks ago, but we have a beta for almost all of them right now. It's, it's insane how fast our engineering teams are moving to ensure that you guys have support for all of this. Similarly, for Python, RabbitMQ, these are just some of the other instrumentation uh, support uh, things that uh, the teams have been working hard on. Now, out of the box instrumentation is great. It's great for Jon Snow who knows nothing because he wants out of the box visibility. But then there are some of these very sophisticated uh, applications or bespoke applications that we cannot, we do not support out of the box. So for those applications, uh, I'm sure all of you have some or the other application in your stack that you know New Relic doesn't support out of the box. For those, we've been working really hard to ensure that we can provide you a a set of APIs that are sor sort of consistent across the language ecosystems that can help you instrument your bespoke applications. And when we think of these APIs, we sort of think of visibility in uh, two major categories. One is to provide you visibility into the application code. So basically, you can create transactions within your applications and follow them along and see what's happening with that exact transaction. Secondly, if your application is talking to any external services, making database calls, or talking to ex external messaging queues, then we, we have a set of APIs that will help you instrument that too. So that way, you've covered it across the spectrum. Across your, For your application, you can not only see the application code, like the performance of it within your application, but to any other external segments that you're working with. 
There's actually a session on APIs right after this if you guys want to attend. Uh, I highly recommend you should. Now that's great with APIs and with the out of the box visibility. Yes, you know exactly what's happening with your transactions, which is pretty awesome. But your applications are actually running on certain infrastructure or in our virtual machines. Uh, in case of Java, Java, Java virtual machine. And this is something that we announced support for back in April. I'm not sure how many of you guys are using Node. But this is a pretty powerful view of what's happening within your Node uh, runtime environment. You can actually look at uh, these graphs and you can see you know, a spike in CPU utilization. You can actually detect a lot of uh, memory leaks and stuff like that with this page. We have a similar page for Go, Ruby, Java. So across our language ecosystems, we have this uh, view of what's happening in the runtime of your application. This is brand new. No one's heard of it yet, but you guys are hearing it for the first time. Any of you have applications that you have in Elixir, Perl, Phoenix, C, C++, anybody? Oh my god, no. No one. Oh, you do. Thank god. I was, I was worried that there's nobody in the crowd. Like, what are you guys doing? I, is everyone just writing Java and Ruby? <laughs> Anyways, so we are announcing support for uh, C, C++ agent. We've had a C agent SDK out for a while, the, uh, but uh, the idea is we are rewriting a lot of the stuff that we had earlier. Uh, with this C, C++ agent, you should be able to instrument all your, not only your C, C++ application, but with any language uh, that we don't support out of the box. Like I was talking about, uh, I've spoken to a few customers who have Perl applications or Elixir applications. As long as you can write a C wrapper around those applications, you should be able to use this agent to do exactly what all the other agents do. So you'll be able to see transactions, you'll be able to track HTTP requests, uh, web and non-web requests, sorry, and you should be able to mark errors. So you'll get all of the good stuff that comes with out-of-the-box instrumentation. Now, having said that, Bad Game of Thrones and all analogy number three. Yeah, three. So Danny is landed in Westeros. She's at Dragonstone now. Uh, she needs to go into the fight. She knows how many resources she has, but she needs to know how these resources are connected. So if she's sending one, you know, let's say, the Unsullied to fight at, and I'm not giving away too much now. But anyways, the idea being, if she's sending one of her armies to find, fight somewhere and they go down, she needs to have a backup plan or she should know how the other resources might get affected. And that's exactly what we do with tracing. So if your application, like if you have a like application app stack or application ecosystem that's instrumented with New Relic, if one of the services goes down, you want to be able to know what the impact of that particular service going down is to the rest of your ecosystem. And with tracing, we ex exactly tell you that. You can see how the performance of one of your application or service affects the rest of your stack. And these two screenshots are from products that you probably have seen. They've been around for a while. We have so service maps which help you connect these different uh, applications and show you how the performance of your application is uh, uh, I mean, how these applications are talking to each other and what the performance of those applications is. It gives you basic information on this, but you can always switch back to the APM view to see more detailed analysis of what's happening within the application. Uh, on the bottom right corner here is something that we introduced back in May. If you haven't checked it out, you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's basically our health maps feature. So if you're using APM agents along with an infrastructure agent, sort of brings those two together and gives you a great view of what's happening within, you know, what the health of your application with respect to your infrastructure is. And it brings it all together on one dashboard, which is pretty, pretty powerful because that one shot view of your host and, you know, uh, services can tell you what's really happening within your application stack. Next one. So all that's great. That gives you aggregated view of what's happening within your application. This is something that we announced uh, support for, and Lou mentioned it in his keynote. I think AJ mentioned it yesterday. We announced support for distributed tracing. So I'm, all of you guys who are moving from monolith apps to microservices, you want to know how these services are exactly connected and be able to 
you know, trace each transaction across the application stack. And this is exactly what distributed tracing will give you. You can actually have uh, unique identifiers for these transactions, and you can track the exact path of that particular transaction across your services. So this is something that we, we've announced support for. It's not GA yet, but it's in the works. And if you guys are interested, I'm sure uh, uh, we can talk about it. It's on the roadmap, something we're working on. I cannot commit to any dates yet, but it's definitely something that we are exploring and it's coming in the near future. Last analogy, winter is here or cloud is here. So it's, it's a thing. Everyone is moving or considering moving to the cloud, even if it's not AWS, Azure, private cloud services like Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So it's a pretty real thing. And it's important that we can be here at New Relic can support you no matter what cloud service or provider you decide to choose. So for that, we, uh, the idea is to support all things cloud. And when I say all things cloud, it's, uh, there are two notions of when we say support the cloud. One is basically when you talk about your actual applications and services that exist on the cloud. So let's say you were using an on-prem uh, MySQL DB2 database and you decide to move to a cloud service like DynamoDB or you know, RDS, then at that point you, you need visibility into what's happening within each of these services. And uh, that's what we are trying to do within APM. We've announced support for DynamoDB S3. And in addition, if you have AWS services, then the idea is you need visibility into what's happening with that too both with New Relic APM agents and with the integrations that are available with infrastructure agent, we can actually get, a, we can get complete visibility into what's happening within your application ecosystem. Aaron stood up there, which means my time's up. And that's the end of the content. I hope I've been able to convince you that Software Rose and Vesta Rose are pretty similar because we all have the same problem, one common enemy, not the Night King, but visibility. And here at New Relic, we are here to provide you visibility no matter what you choose to do. Thank you.